Well, thank you, Jonathan, and my thanks to everybody at ADL for inviting me here this morning. You know, I've been in this line of work in one way or another for a long time now, uh, starting out as a line prosecutor in the 90s uh, and then in various roles in the Justice Department, which, among other things, included time overseeing what was then OSI, the Office of Special Investigations, or as they were more commonly known, the Nazi hunters whose particularly rewarding work demonstrated to the world and anyone who might contemplate heinous crimes against the Jewish people that we're going to hunt murderers right down to their dying days. And I'm proud to say that we helped the U.S. track down, denaturalize, and deport more Nazis than all other countries combined. And much like the work we're doing together today, that effort both required and benefited from a close partnership with the Jewish community. The main reason I took this job was my belief in the FBI's core values and mission to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. And I think our mission goals gel very well with yours, to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. And that's one of the reasons we've been such great partners in fighting to stamp out the recent uptick in hate crimes in the U.S. Because both of our organizations understand what can happen when hate is allowed to fester and grow. At the Bureau, we confront that reality from the very moment we bring someone new on board. And I want to thank the ADL today for your support in conducting the training that all of our new special agents and intelligence analysts participate in at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Because of your work, our new agents and analysts confront the reality of just how widespread anti-Semitism and the willingness to turn hate into action really are. Your work reminds our young people, what's at stake, why we all, particularly those of us in law enforcement, must aggressively counter anti-Semitic violence everywhere it appears. Our FBI historian recently pulled the course evaluations written by the very first new agent class to visit the Holocaust Museum more than 20 years ago. And I found one of them particularly striking. That new agent, again, a little over 20 years ago, wrote, the part that lingers in my memory is the photo of the police officer and the German SS officer standing side by side, and the police officer was failing to protect his own citizens. That observation gets to the heart of why standing up to hate is an active pursuit. And it applies now every bit as much as it did back then. It reflects what we stand for and the values we aspire to at the FBI, to protect Americans from harm with unwavering resolve. Unfortunately, as Jonathan outlined, anti-Semitism remains a pervasive and present fact. And we at the FBI see up close, day in and day out, the actions that hatred drives. Jewish people continue to face repeated violence and very real threats from all kinds of actors simply for being who they are. A full 63% of religious hate crimes are motivated by anti-Semitism, targeting a group that makes up just 2.4% of our population. Foreign terrorist organizations like ISIS and others have promoted anti-Semitic violent extremism for decades, and they continue to target Jewish Americans in their attack plots. But we also confront the threat of people here, on our own soil, whose hateful views, often paraded online, boil over into acts of violence. And there are too many grim examples to choose from, but consider the members of the Jewish community in Poway, California, whose synagogue was the target of domestic terrorism in 2019. The gunman 
in that attack, in a vile act driven by hatred, murdered one member of the congregation and wounded three others, including a rabbi. Thanks to the investigative work of our San Diego field office, he's now serving a life sentence without parole, plus an additional 30 years for good measure. But his victims, their loved ones, and their communities have to live with the trauma of what he did for the rest of their lives, too. The attack at the synagogue in Colleyville, Texas, earlier this year was another tragic example. It happened almost three years later and over a thousand miles away from Poway by a perpetrator who cloaked himself in a different motivation. He referenced violent jihad. But taken together, those two attacks, just two of far too many, demonstrate the tragic reality that the Jewish community uniquely ends up on the receiving end of hate-fueled attacks from all sides. And I'd venture to say that no community feels more threatened by that boiling over into violence than yours. Now, the threats may be coming from all sides, but we're hitting back at them full force. And we're doing it from multiple FBI programs, both our criminal and counterterrorism divisions that right now are laser focused on the problem. On the criminal side, we've designated civil rights, specifically including hate crimes, as a national threat priority. That means we've surged more agents and analysts to work those cases across the country. On the counterterrorism front, with the Joint Terrorism Task Forces that we have in all 56 of our field offices, we have nearly 4,500 agents and state and local law enforcement partners working counterterrorism. And in 2019, we established the Domestic Terrorism Hate Crimes Fusion Cell, bringing together experts in both. That team addresses the intersection of domestic terrorism and hate crimes, and they share information and resources with our partners in real time. And that Fusion Cell's efforts are already bearing fruit. Just last year, in 2021, Richard Holzer, was convicted on both hate crime and explosive charges for plotting to bomb the Temple Emanuel Synagogue in Pueblo, Colorado. Holzer told undercover agents he wanted to do something that would tell Jewish people in the community they weren't welcome in the town. But thanks to the work of our fusion cell, instead, we disrupted his plot before it occurred and for the first time in recent history, made a proactive arrest on a hate crimes charge. So whether we're confronting the threat through a hate crime or counterterrorism lens or both, our focus is on preventing violent attacks. And within the bounds of the law, we're creative in how we do that. When tragedy does strike, we move heaven and earth to find those responsible and to help heal the victims, their families, and their community. Much like we did four years ago in October after the horrific attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. We raced our SWAT team, lab, explosive experts, crisis negotiators, and more to the scene. We also remained a fixture for those affected afterward. In the way our victim services response team provided food and clothing, grief counseling, financial assistance, Assistance and one-stop shopping for federal resources, but also, but also in our continued engagement with the Pittsburgh Jewish community. I know when I visited the Tree of Life scene and just saw the scene firsthand, I was just struck, not just by the evil done to individuals that day, but to the depth of the wound to the community. And it made me angry. It left me feeling the steel in our commitment to battle hate-fueled violence everywhere it touches Jewish Americans. And it once again left me grateful for your help in bringing our new folks to the Holocaust Museum, because there just can't be enough reminders of what we're up against. Those are some of the things 
we in the FBI are doing to address the violence. But these threats increasingly require a whole of society approach. So we're also raising awareness through our national anti-hate crimes campaign, which aims to educate witnesses and victims on how to identify and report hate crimes. And we've been engaging the public's help, too. That includes community leaders, mental health and social services professionals, faith communities, and civil rights and minority groups. Now, I mentioned that our mission is to protect the American people and to uphold the Constitution, both. And both aspects are equally important. We can't stop people from thinking or saying hateful things, but there is a right way under our Constitution and within the rule of law for someone to express their beliefs, whatever they happen to be, and violence ain't it. So what we can do, and will always do, is bring the full force of the FBI and our partners to bear across the country and in every community when someone threatens or commits violence. We don't let up, and like the Nazi hunters in OSI, our memory is long. We never forget. I'd like to leave off with a famous quote from Hillel, the ancient Jewish scholar. And many of you will be familiar with this, but he wrote, and I quote, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? That teaching goes hand in hand with that photo from the Holocaust Museum I mentioned earlier of the police officer standing next to the SS officer failing to protect people from harm. Now, I love the FBI because it's a collection of men and women who answered Hillel's question for themselves and underlined their answer by offering their careers, even at the risk of their lives, in service of their purpose. We are for others, for those under threat who need protecting. From the violence and destruction of Kristallnacht in Germany 84 years ago this week to the threats and violence targeting Jewish communities here in the US just across the river last week, we at the FBI recognize that the threat of violent extremism is real and it's urgent. And we devote ourselves every day to protecting the Jewish community and all American people from these heinous acts. And I can assure you, we'll remain relentless. Thank you very much. <laughs>